today I've got a nice combinatorial number theory problem that comes from one of my favorite problem solving books. And that's a book from Paul Zeitz called The Art and Craft of Problem Solving. Although I think this book is pretty hard to get nowadays. I think it's out of print. But maybe if you've got a place to find it, post it in the comments. Okay, so let's see what our goal is. We want to show that the set of weights, 1, 3, 3 squared, in other words, 9, 3 cubed, 3 to the 4th, so on and so forth, so all powers of 3 can be used uniquely to weigh any weight of integer unit. So you could think that these are maybe like grams, then it would be in units. And here, well, what does it mean for a weight to have negative integral units? Well, we'll spell that out as we kind of play with the scales here in our examples. But before we look at those examples, I'd like to point out that the techniques used in this problem are explored in my number theory version two class at the very, very end, where we look at the mathematics of Ramanujan and integer partitions. So you can find a playlist for that if you dig into the channel. Okay, so here are some examples. My first example is if we want to weigh something that is five units in weight. So that means we'd put the weight over here on the right. We can think about the right side of the scale as being the positive side. Then we'd also need to put a weight that is three units and one unit over on the right. That makes the total weight on the right nine units, which we can balance over here by putting a nine gram or a nine unit weight on the left hand side. In other words, on the negative side. So maybe we would read this as five equals, let's see, one plus three minus nine. Okay, good. Now let's look at n equals minus 16 just to give us a negative example as well. So that means we'd put 16 over here on the negative side of the scale. And then the balancing configuration that works here is to put a nine unit weight on the left hand side and then a 27 unit weight on the right hand side. And so this could be expressed via negative 16 equals nine minus 27. Okay, so what we'd really like to do is rewrite this question in the language of integer partitions. And so I think maybe the best way to do that is as follows. This question is like finding the number of partitions of n, so where n is our arbitrarily chosen integer, using parts so the parts are plus minus one, plus minus three, plus minus nine, plus minus 27. But each of these at most once. So one time. That means if I use a positive 27, I can't use a negative 27. If I use a positive three, I can't use a negative three. Furthermore, I can't use three two times. I can only use three zero or one times. But maybe before we dig into this, let's recall what a partition is. Well, that's essentially the factoring of a number into a sum. So this number five, factored into a sum as one plus three minus nine would be a partition of five using parts where we've got one, three, and minus nine. Now this is maybe a non-standard way to look at partitions. And in fact, if you look at the definition of a partition, this will not line up with the definition. Although this is close enough to the theory of partitions that the same sort of techniques will apply here. Okay, so now that being said, let's get rid of this. We'll carefully restate the problem and then solve it. Okay, so after we looked at those examples and motivated our solution, let's introduce some notation and then restate our goal in terms of that notation. So for an integer n, I wanna set p of n equal to the number of partitions of n using parts plus minus one, plus minus three, plus minus nine, so on and so forth where these parts are all used zero or one times. And furthermore, if you use a positive version of the part, you can't use the negative version of the part and vice versa. And let's look over here. 
This says that the set of weights can be used uniquely to weigh any weight. So being able to use any or being able to weigh any weight means that this PN should never be equal to zero. And then the uniqueness says that this PN should be equal to one. So that restates our goal as showing that P of N equals one for all integers N. Okay, so now we're going to look at the generating function for P of N to get a handle on how this works. And the motivation for doing this is essentially the fact that many, many, many questions involving integer partitions are easily or more easily solved using integer partitions. Okay, so let's look at the sum over all integers of P of N Q to the N. So I'll use Q as my formal variable here for my generating function for p of n, kind of in the spirit of Ramanujan. So he used q for the formal variable. Okay, so let's notice that we have a factorization of this based off of this rule right here. I'll write the factorization, then I'll point towards why we know that's the factorization. But if you need kind of a revisor of this or a review of this, again, check out the playlist. Okay, so using parts that are plus minus one will include a factor of the form q to the minus one plus one plus q to the one. So this term right here, q to the minus one, would be using minus one one time. This one is using neither of those at all. It's like q to the zero, and then this q to the one is like using the number one one time. Okay, nice. And then after that, we've got q to the minus three plus one plus q cubed. Then after that, q to the minus nine plus one plus q to the nine, and that is an infinite product. So each of those follows kind of the same reasoning. So q to the minus three is like using minus three as one of our parts. If we take this term from this part of our product, the one, that's like not using negative three or positive three. And then q cubed is like using positive three as part of our parts. Okay, so now this is kind of screaming out to factor something out of the denominator of each of these and then have it look like a polynomial, which hopefully we can simplify. And in this case, we can take this one and write it as one plus q plus q squared over q. So I think that's pretty obvious. And then here we have one plus q cubed plus q to the six over q cubed. And then this next one will be one plus q to the nine plus q to the 18 over q to the nine. And each of these are separated. So I'll put parentheses here. And that's an infinite product. But now I can factor this numerator, or really not factor this numerator, but rewrite this numerator for each of these terms as something simpler. So I'll write it down for the first one and then we'll continue on. So this one minus q, sorry, one plus q plus q squared is the same thing as one minus q cubed over one minus q. That's just from the factorization of one minus q cubed as a difference of cubes. So as a difference of cubes, we get a one minus q and then this term, but that cancels here. So we've achieved the same thing, rewriting this as follows. Okay, now we're gonna play that same game for the rest of them. So let's see, we'll have plus, sorry, times one minus q to the nine over q cubed, one minus q cubed. Then the next one will be one minus q to the 27 over q to the nine times one minus q to the nine, and then so on and so forth. And now just to be careful, I'm gonna introduce a limit. So it's like a limit of a partial product, which is effectively the careful way of doing this. So I'm gonna write this as the limit as n approaches infinity, where this capital N will be something to do with the final term of my partial product, then the one that I'll end with here will be one minus q to the three to the n plus one. And then in the denominator, I'll have q to the three to the n, and then one minus q to the three to the n. So that's just following that same pattern. Okay, so that's looking good. But now notice that a ton of stuff cancels. 
So this one minus Q cubed will cancel with this one minus Q cubed. This one minus Q to the nine will cancel with this one minus Q to the nine. This one minus Q to the 27 will cancel with something that comes afterwards. And then finally, this one minus Q to the three to the N will cancel with something that comes before. So in the end, we're left with all of these just single powers of Q in the denominator. And then we also have a single one minus Q in the denominator. And then this one minus Q to the three to the N plus one in the numerator. So that's gonna leave us with this. We have the limit as N approaches infinity. And then we'll have one minus Q to the three to the N plus one over, so let's see, we'll have Q to the one plus three plus nine plus all the way up to three to the N. So that's because we've got Q to the one, Q to the three, Q to the nine, all the way up. And then finally in the denominator, we have one minus Q. Okay, so that's where we're at. So I'll bring that up and then we'll about finish it off. Okay, so here's where we left the last board. We had our generating function was the limit as n goes to infinity. Remember that was from our taking our partial product. One minus q to the three to the n plus one over q to this sum, which is like a finite geometric series, then times one minus q. So now let's start simplifying that. The first thing that I'll do is I'll take this thing and factor it out. So notice that if q is equal to 1, we have a root. That means we should be able to factor 1 minus q out. And in fact, we can. That'll leave us with 1 minus q, and then 1 plus q plus q squared, and then ending at q to the 3 to the n plus 1 minus 1, where some of that stuff is in the numerator and some, some of that stuff is in the denominator. Okay, the important takeaway is that this one minus Q term will cancel with this one minus Q term right here. Okay, next up, we'd like to take this exponent and use the finite sum of a geometric series to simplify it. So I'll let you guys recall what the sum of a finite geometric series will give us, but it'll have the following form three to the n plus one minus one over three minus one, which is equal to two. So we're left with something like that. Okay, so now let's rewrite what we've got. We have the limit as n goes to infinity of, let's see, one plus q plus q squared all the way up to q to the three to the n plus one minus one, and then that's all over q to the three n plus one minus one over two. So something like that. So the important thing here is that we get negative and positive powers of q. Since we're taking a limit, it's not exactly important what those negative and positive powers are, so I'll just write it as follows. This is gonna turn into the limit as n goes to infinity of, I'll write this as maybe q to the minus a of n plus q to the minus a of n, uh, let's see, that'll be plus one, plus all the way up to q to the b of n, minus one plus q to the b of n. You might say, well, what are those a's and b's? Well, they're represented by the differences of the powers here and here. So in fact, a of n will just be this number right here. So let's maybe write that down. So a of n is just this number. And then b of n will be the difference of this number and this number. But the important thing over here, which I'll put kind of in a star, the box around it, are that as n goes to infinity, a of n and b of n also tend towards infinity. So that it gives us a doubly infinite sum of all powers of q where all of the coefficients are equal to one. In other words, we have the sum as n goes from all integers in other words, like negative infinity to infinity of q to the n. But what does that tell us? 
we've got the sum of p of n, q to the n is just the sum of one times q to the n, but comparing both sides here, so comparing this with this tells us exactly what we need, in particular that p of n is equal to one for all n and z, but that was the finishing blow to finish this thing off, and that's a good place to stop.